Well, I'm particularly proud of this window of St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is, is why I'm a priest. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I heard one of the arguments for God's existence from a Dominican friar in our high school, and it changed my life. It was like a, a bell going off in my mind, and eventually it, it reached its way into my heart, and that's really why I'm still on the path I'm on, the path of priesthood and the faith and religion. So I have a great personal affection for Thomas Aquinas, and I'm very proud he was the first window installed in our uh, new chapel. The connection to John Paul is very powerful as well because John Paul uh, did his doctoral work on uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Thomas's uh, writings uh, uh, animate so much of John Paul's uh, sermons and writings and philosophy. So he's a very key figure uh, for him. He also attended the uh, Angelicum, which is the uh, College of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. I'll say a few things now about this, uh, I think, beautifully rendered window. There, of course, is Thomas in his beautiful Dominican habit, 13th century philosopher, theologian. The book he holds there has a citation from the first part of the Summa Theologiae, his great masterpiece. It says, it's impossible that in God his existence should be different than his essence, which I know sounds extremely rarefied and abstract, but actually is naming, as I, I've taught the course in the doctrine of God out here for many years, it names what's most distinctive about God, that God is not one being among many, but God is the sheer act of existence itself in and through which all things exist. And I've always presented that as the key to understanding so much of Catholic theology. So I wanted that to be uh, front and center in his window. Some of the symbols around the uh, border of this, I think, are, are wonderful. First of all, the, the flowers, the columbine, uh, Latin columba for dove. So it's symbolic of, uh, of wisdom. And of course, Thomas is the great wisdom figure in our tradition. He's called the doctor communis, the common doctor. This wonderfully rendered uh, ox over here might strike you as strange, but when Thomas was a young man, he was always a kind of a big and taciturn fellow. And his students uh, made fun of him, they mocked him. And they called him the dumb ox of Sicily. He was from southern Italy. He was the dumb ox. Well, his um, teacher, Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great, who knew Thomas's mind, he said, I assure you the bellowing of that ox will one day fill the world. So we have, in a wonderful little irony, the dumb ox there. Above him is the uh, little tower. When Thomas joined the Dominicans, of course, it was to the chagrin of his uh, parents who wanted him to become a, a Benedictine, perhaps abbot of Monte Cassino. The Dominicans at the time were an upstart group. They were mendicants, beggars. So it was, they thought beneath the dignity of the family. So his brothers kidnapped him at their mother's uh, uh, request, and they imprisoned him in a, a family uh, castle for a year hoping to dissuade him, but Thomas uh, persuaded them that he had this vocation and finally was let loose from the tower. You see above his head is, of course, the, the quill. He's one of the great writers in the whole tradition. Over here, a veritas, it's the shield, it's the symbol of the Dominican order. So Thomas, in many ways, is the pride and joy of the Dominicans. The two windows are linked that way because Frasati was a third order Dominican, so we saw his Dominican symbol, the dog with the torch in his mouth. And then down here, of course, the, uh, the monstrance, the Blessed Sacrament. See, one thing I wanted to do in a lot of the windows is emphasize the Blessed Sacrament because students will be coming in here to uh, uh, pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Eucharistic adoration links together the saints of all the different ages, and it speaks to the students who will be doing the very same thing here. Speaking of which, the bottom scene is, is one of my favorites in the life of Aquinas. Toward the end of his life, and it's the third part of the Summa Theologiae, he's writing on the Eucharist. And he writes a masterpiece to understand the Eucharist theologically. But Thomas felt it had not done justice to this great sacrament. So he took the text, we have it there as a book, but he took the text of this treatise, and he put it at the foot of the cross. And he knelt and said, Lord, is this worthy of you, you know? And the, the wonderful story says that from the cross came a voice that said, Thomas, you've written well concerning this sacrament. What would you have as a reward? And Thomas said, and you have it right here, non nisi te domine, which is Latin for, I'll have only you. I'll have nothing except you, Lord. Which I would tell the students, if you ever ask that question by the Lord, that's the right answer <laughs> to give. And it sums up Thomas's life and spirituality. That's what he wanted. He wanted union with Christ. So the non-nisite, I hope, uh, is not just a historical um, memory, 
but will resonate very much in the hearts of our students. That's what they should ask the Lord for as well. So that's the, um, I think, you know, wonderful uh, montage of, of symbols and images in this, uh, in this beautiful window. In all the windows, we're going to have a version of, of this, you know, this kind of jewel-like or pearl-like uh, decoration. Well, that's a, a biblical idea. During time of, of penitence, you would take off your fancier clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. But when you're in right relation to God, you sort of decorate yourself in this beautiful way. So it symbolizes the, the beauty of this heavenly figure who now is in right relationship with God and therefore is bedecked with this beautiful uh, ornamentation. Those two a little touch here. See the leaves on, at Thomas's feet. Well, see, we're not Platonists, by which I mean the goal of the spiritual life is not simply to escape from this world to some higher world. The biblical vision is the renewal of the whole of creation. What we expect is a new heavens and a new earth. Or if you want, heaven and earth coming together in this new embrace. So see how these participate, if you want, in both realms, both the earthly and the heavenly. And the saints are kind of bridge figures, if you want. They've reached the, uh, the culmination of heaven, but they're still in connection with the earth, and they're trying to bring the earth into harmony with heaven. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. And that's symbolized by the, the kind of coming out from the heavenly scene into the earthly uh, realm. The same is true of Frasati. In his case, it was a rock, his foot standing on that rock that kind of brings him out into our uh, dimension. Thank you.